Yahweh, the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Remember the Shabbat day to keep it set apart. Six days will you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Shabbat of Yahweh your Elohim. In it you will not do any work. For in six days Yahweh made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. That is why Yahweh blessed the seventh day and set it apart. Speak also unto the children of Yisrael, saying, Above all, my Shabbatot you will keep, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, so that you may know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. The Israelites are to observe the Shabbat, celebrating it for the generations to come as an enduring covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days, Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he abstained from work and rested. And it will come to pass that from one new month to another, and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh will come to worship before me, says Yahweh. We minister Shalom, Shalom Alechem. Shalom Alechem, Malachi Hasharet, Malachi Eyon, Mimelech, Malachi Hamlachim, Akadosh Baruch, Hu. Boachim la Shalom, Malachi Hasharet, Malachi <laughs> Mimelech Malche Hamlahim Akadosh Baruch Shalom be yours, ministering Malachim, Malachim of the El Elyon, coming forth from the Sovereign of Sovereigns, the Set Apart One, blessed is He. May your coming forth be in Shalom. Malachim of Shalom, Malachim of the Most High, coming forth from the King of Kings, the Set Apart One, blessed is He. Bless us with Shalom, Malachim of Shalom, Malachim of the Most High, coming forth from the King of Kings, the Set Apart One, blessed is He. We give thanks and praise. Let us pray. Father Elohim, in these days of awe, in these days of teruah, in these days of uncertainty, now on the day after Yom Kippur, we want to thank you for the justification that you placed upon us for the judgment that's already gone through in regards to us and that we have no more reason to worry about our future, about our children, about our provisions, but being in you and in the kingdom of the beloved son, you have taken us Yea, stolen us from the dominion of darkness to bring us into this light. We pray that you would help us to take full advantage of the great mercies, gifts, and services that you've rendered to us. We lift up our voices now on behalf of those who we feel should come into this kingdom but may never without the move of the Spirit within them. 
We pray now that you would give us opportunities to sow seeds to needs in these people round about us, that in the end, all Israel might be saved. And we thank you for blessing us with this fellowship and time together where we who are like-minded can enjoy a few minutes of respite, a few minutes of worship, a message, and we pray that that message might come from your heart. Now, Father, as we go into the rest of this service and into that message, we pray that you would anoint our tongues, anoint our ears, most of all, anoint our minds to remember these things we pray in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. Amen. We hear the word and testimony. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Let the prophets prophesy. The words of the prophet. Whenever the ark set out, Moshe said, Arise, O Yahweh, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee before you. Hallelujah. I hope that we all realize that our atonement includes the benefit of eternal life. And not just eternal life of misery, but an eternal life of bliss, accomplishment, meaningful work, never-ending meaningful work, the final gathering of all Gentiles, that Israel all comes in on account of us, and we come in on account of you. Now, uh, we look at the other side of the coin in regards to what we have heard about sinners and their future, and especially this, the greatest lie ever told. You will surely not die. Do you remember who said that? Who lied? Well, our Savior does. He says of that old serpent, the devil is a liar and the father of it. He commences his attack on our race by saying they should not surely die if they disobeyed Elohim. That devil, he was successful in that game, and he's plagued that same card in some form on men ever since he first swept paradise with it. Since then, he's turned that card over and over and over again. But it's the same card still. It is still inscribed, you will surely not die. Now, he makes of use, use of it to insinuate that Elohim doesn't love or pity people, seeing he has determined that people won't die but be kept alive in eternal and indescribable torments, and hereafter to be committed to the theological hell where it is impossible for such miserable ones to cease from sin. I can't fathom that the wicked will be kept eternally alive in torments and never die, and that it was invented to inspire hard thoughts about Elohim and keep folks from turning back to him. This teaching has kept more people away from Elohim than any other doctrine that was ever promulgated. For if some minds have been affected by it, they are seldom found to be true believers and hardly pretend to live in obedience to Elohim unless under some strong delusion Others, without any proper reflection upon Elohim's Torah, have rejected eternal punishment 
because of the nature of what the consensus thinkers say is to be inflicted upon them, whilst others have lived and died in real infidelity, because they couldn't believe that a being whose word declares that he is love could inflict such punishment on even the worst and most bitter of his enemies. So here I'll attempt in short order, to show you that the death Elohim has threatened as the wages of sin is not immortality in misery, but an actual and total deprivation of life. I say then, in opposition to the old serpent, if people don't come to Messiah, they will surely die lost with no hope but in the resurrection. Let me here recall your attention to the question at issue. It's not whether a person can be immortal, nor whether the righteous will be immortal, but will the conscious being or soul of the wicked be eternal? Is the punishment of the wicked being in sin and suffering forever? or eternal cessation from life. The term immortal in this discourse means exempt from death. It never means to die. Immortal never means never ending. Immortal never means to be perpetually applied. Are the wicked immortal too? Are the wicked destined to a state of eternal sin and suffering? Keep in mind that words are not to be explained as to mean more than their primary significance. Though they may say, and often do, what they say it signifies sometimes less. The scriptural words employed in the situation of the wicked are perishing, utterly perishing, utterly consumed, utterly destroyed, destroyed forever, burned up with unquenchable fire, that they will be left with neither root nor branch, perdition, second death, etc., etc., etc. Let's begin with a couple of these terms. Perish. Perish signifies to cease to have existence, to die or decay away. Which of these definitions convey the idea of eternal sin and eternal suffering? Which of these ideas as definitions of perish designate such? Can that which has unending life be said to die? Can that which is always to continue in being be said to cease to have existence? Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 18, and by the way, this is one of the things that we really need Paul for. He says, then, if Messiah be not raised, they also that are fallen asleep in Messiah are perished. What? In a state of eternal sin and suffering? This supposition is so absurd that those who make a case for eternal tortures must admit that the term perish here means to cease to be, not tormented forever. By what fair interpretation of language can they ever make it to mean anything else but to cease to be when spoken of the final state of the lost? Though the term is sometimes used to denote something less than an actual ceasing to be, it doesn't therefore allow or follow that it is used to mean something far greater than perish or more horrible. To apply this term to an eternal sin and misery is to force a sense upon that word perish that is not most unwarrantable and unjustified. Let us keep constantly in mind that all humanity, by their natural birth, have no access to the tree of life. Consequently, we're perishing already and without immortality. 
Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. Here, eternal life or everlasting life is the opposite of perishing. Is everlasting life of sin and misery the opposite of everlasting life? In that view, the wicked have just as much everlasting life as the righteous, though under different circumstances. But we, says Paul, are unto Elohim a sweet scent of Messiah in them that are saved and them that are perishing. Here, perishing and life are put in opposition. And the term perish is explained by the apostle himself to mean death, the ceasing of life, and not eternal life in misery or torments. I must call your attention to one fact, and that is, in the Acts of the Apostles, the very place where we should expect to find the teaching of eternal torments, because the Apostles were, after all, addressing sinners, there is not a particle of evidence to support the common Christian theory that an eternal life roiling in the fires of hell is destined for the wicked. The views we maintain are most clearly set forth by Paul in the 13th chapter in a discourse unto the blaspheming Jews, telling them that they judged themselves unworthy of everlasting life and saying, behold, you despisers and wonder and perish. What an excellent occasion had the apostle to have aroused the Jews by the common Christian theory, had he believed it. I ask any preacher these days, and I have asked, hold on a second. <clears throat> I have asked, and maybe you have too, who believes in the eternal life of all people, in preaching to such hardened sinners as the apostle addressed, contents himself with such language as the apostle here used. No way they're going to tell them you're going to be roiling in hell forever, an everlasting death, an everlasting life. They first describe the misery of the sinner in hell, and then with the strongest figures they can produce, go on to give their notions of its duration, which they can't find enough harsh words to even describe. Paul did no such thing. There is not a particle of evidence of it in all his preachings and writings. He said they would perish. The next words we look at are die and death. These terms again signify to perish to come to nothing, or the extinction of life. Hence, when these terms are applied to people in regard to the final result of sin, we ought to have good evidence that death does indeed mean death, the ceasing of life, not eternal life in torments. Again, Paul in Romans 1, speaking to the wicked characters, he says, who, knowing the judgment of Elohim, that they that commit such things are worthy of death. In the second chapter, fifth verse and onwards, he speaks, and I quote, of the righteous judgment of Elohim, when wrath will be visited on the wicked, and the death spoken of is expressly called perishing with which the wicked will be visited in the day when Elohim will judge the secrets of people by Yahshua HaMashiach. Death then, as the apostle explains it, when applied to the punishment of the wicked, means to perish and perish immediately. The soul or person that sins, it will die, relates to the sinner's final doom. Is Elohim happy about this? As I live, saith Yahweh Elohim, 
I have no pleasure in death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn you, for why will you die? Life and death are put in opposition, not life and consciousness being in misery, but life and death without any qualifying terms to lead anyone to suspect that they are to be understood any other way than in their most obvious sense. Life on one side, death on the other. If you were to put the Bible into the hands of a person who never heard a word of explanation, who never heard a preacher, he would so understand it as such. Lest I should take up too much time in the examination of these terms, I'll pass over for the remainder of this message. Having, as we judge, established the point that the wicked have not immortality, we might leave it to the believer in the opposite theory that they do to prove his position from the Bible and pursue the subject no further. We won't, however, shrink from meeting the supposed objections to the scriptural view of life and death. And I think that in this short time already, we have fairly well proved that those in Elohim will live and those outside of Elohim will die in the fullest meaning of the term. Now, these objections don't arise from any positive proof in the Bible that the wicked are immortal, but from circumstantial evidence drawn from expressions used in reference to the punishment of the impenitent. The first objection is found in the language of the Savior, who is purported to say, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, this is said that proves that the soul is immortal. First, whatever this punishment is, it is put in opposition still to life. If thy hand or foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt or maimed into life than having two feet or hands that is, where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Who doesn't see that here is the opposite of life, and therefore is death, utter extinction of being without any possibility of escape? In a parallel passage, our Savior says, If thy right eye or hand offend thee, cast it from thee. For it is profitable for me, thee, that one of thy members should perish, there's that word again, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. And I say, the Savior is purported to have said this. We'll find out about that in a few minutes. But in his preaching, supposedly, the worm that does not die and the fire that is not quenched, we see as another form of the expression for perishing. And now we'll see how that works. This expression is a quotation from Isaiah 66, 24. One of the first times I preached this true teaching from the scripture, I had someone come up to me afterwards years ago and bring to me Isaiah 66, 24, which I don't have to quote for you because you already know it. The worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. It's applied to the carcasses of people. If you go back and look at the context and which, which Yahshua is purported to have quoted, which I presume that preachers won't pretend were immortal though they really often do. Then we will have immortal carcasses and immortal souls when neither of these is immortal. But the prophecy is describing the kind of doom inflicted upon the vilest offenders who are not only slain, 
with their bodies deprived of the rites of burial and burned to ashes or left to molder above ground and be devoured by worms. If the fire was quenched, they would not be utterly consumed, but something would remain and there wouldn't be entire destruction, entire perishing. Oh, suppose my house is on fire. When my neighbors arrive to help, I say, oh, the effort is useless. The fire is unquenchable. What then do I mean? That the fire will burn eternally? Any schoolboy knows that I mean simply that the house will be totally consumed. The fire will go out when the fuel is gone. I'm sorry, I have a little bit problem with my word processor here. Click the wrong button and you end up on somebody else's desktop. Now, will anyone pretend that all these fires that won't be quenched are never to go out in the strict sense of the word eternal? Doesn't anyone see that as long as there is fuel, the fires will burn, but not after? If they mean that the fires will never go out, do we see that these same places are on fire even now? Look around. Do you see the fires? But as much stress is laid on the text under consideration and on others where our sovereign speaks of hellfire, puros Gehenna, translated wrongly as the fire of hell, we will examine the subject more fully, especially as by our masters using that expression, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. It is concluded that he teaches the immortality of all people and the endless torment of the wicked? Is that what it's all about? These words given the master about hellfire have proved to have been added after the canon was closed by Catholic scribes who believed like the Greeks that all people have eternal souls and that hell is literal and eternal, and that the soul dipping into Tartarus or Gehenna is going to live there forever because the fire is going to burn forever. And since they have immortal souls, they're going to be there for the next millennium to come and on and on until time falls apart. In good translations today, these sayings of worms and hellfires are not even in there because it has been determined through study of the texts of the Bible that these sayings were never said by the Master in the first place. They're additions. Check your Bible study notes and you'll see. Let it be remembered, the words in question never even occur in the Septuagint, not in any classic author in the world, but they are contramanded by those that would preach in eternal hell, thinking they're going to scare people into heaven, which never, ever works. You can take the Jesus walk a thousand times. You can pay your premium on your fire insurance, every year until you die. It won't make a bit of difference. But we have to look to the Jews to discover what this hellfire is, this Gehenna, translated hell. And most of you already know, let's go through it. Hell here, or Gehenna, is derived from the word Geh in Hebrew, which means valley, and Hinnom, that's a person's name. This place, the Valley of Hinnom, has nothing to do with a pagan understanding of a fiery hell. The Valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, once the celebrated place of the horde worship of Moloch, and afterwards polluted with every species of filth 
as well as the carcasses of animals and dead bodies of malefactors in order to avert the pestilence that such a massive corruption would occasion, constant fires were kept burning. Though they're not burning now. In the time of the Savior's personal ministry, some Jews used this tra trash heap to figuratively represent the punishment of the wicked. As our Savior adopted a figure of their own and used it only with Jews, it must be evident that they used it in harmony with the facts, though it was not a fact. Now, what were the facts? Whatever was cast into the fire in the valley of Hinnom had to be destroyed, like at the fiery dump in your town. If any flesh would fall outside the fire, the worms and carrion eaters would devour it. Nothing escaped utter destruction. No one was so stupid as to have thought anything was thrown in there to be preserved. The only idea that could have attached itself to this form of expression must have been that of a total and utter consumption, destruction, a perishing without remedy, recovery, or escape. Indeed, you can't escape from the burning trash heap because you are dead. Indeed, this valley was the Jerusalem dump, but now, look at it. Now, there are no fires. If you look at the Valley of Hinnom today, it's been made over. It has become a beautiful valley for vacationers and picnickers. Not a sign of an eternal fire. Not one. It's beautified. It's been renewed. It's been restored. That part of creation that gave so many people so many headaches has been recovered. Now, this is one of the strongest expressions in the Bible to disprove the idea that the wicked being eternally conscious in such a place. For even the fire of hell has gone out. The impenitent and the incorrigible sinner, like the filth about Jerusalem and the dead bodies of animals and people, if not utterly consumed and destroyed, would keep alive the plague in the universe. Hence, they will be cast into the fire of Gehenna to be totally destroyed, and therefore fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna, purposely mistranslated hell in Matthew 10, 28. One of my friends in the church years ago uh, worked in the aluminum factory. And what he did is take old siding and throw it into the pot, the burning pot. And I asked him, how long does it, does it take the aluminum to melt when it gets in the melting pot? And he said, oh, oh, oh the minute it hits there, it liquefies. And uh, I asked him, what if a man would fall in there? How long would he live? He would be totally consumed like the aluminum we throw in completely melted immediately gone nothing left you may and i might be of the happy number who has avoided this dump if we would be then let us seek holiness of heart and life if messiah alone gives and is life get to know him love him obey him you can't love him without obeying him if you love me you'll keep my commandments and what are his commandments the same as his father's and then once we do we will join the blessed company john her praising the strains just described which may which may the great sovereign grant us through Yahshua, Moshiach, our Savior. And some use his own words to prove their invalid point. These will go away into everlasting punishment, 
but the righteous into life eternal, Matthew 25, 46. This text doesn't say a word about the happiness of the one or of the misery of the other. The term there in the Greek is ionion. It's translated eternal and everlasting, and it doesn't prove either the righteous or the wicked would have a perpetual and unending existence. In fact, the word ionion actually means an age, not an eternity. The corresponding word in Hebrew, olam, which is used more than 300 times in the Tanakh, most of the time expressing some indefinite period of time that will end. An age, same thing, an age, set beginning, set end. Thus, the ironical ministry is called an everlasting priesthood, a priesthood haolam vae. Where's the ironic priesthood now? It's perished. The hills are called everlasting hills hills. Neither of these have proved to be eternal, unless we take this in some kind of superstitious, mental, multidimensional, or depraved ideas that came out from the heathen, heathens, especially the Greeks and Teutonics. Take the following words from Isaiah 40, 25. It says, the everlasting Elohim. Compare it with Habakkuk 3, 6 the everlasting mountains. Will the mountains continue as long as Elohim? How will the advocates of an unending misery evade the conclusion that the mountains will continue as long as Elohim? A school kid knows better than that. The Bible declares that Elohim is the king immortal, not subject to be dissolved. It can't be dissolved. It can't be dissolved. It is not a person in the sense of weak flesh. While the everlasting mountains will be scattered and melted, and they have been in the course of time, our geologists tell us. So now what's the highest crime in human law? I think it's murder. What is the punishment for murder? Protracted torture? Does a murderer have his teeth torn out and then he's dis, uh, deprived of a dentist? Or is it the deprivation of life entirely? Isn't it called capital punishment? Not because the criminal endures more pain or as much as he might by some other, but because he is cut off from life. Emotional pain may be a consequence of his crime, but the law doesn't say he will feel bad, but that he will die. But say the consensus, there is a dreadful hereafter to be, <clears throat> hereafter that he will, I'm sorry, there is the dreadful hereafter to the criminal. But whatever the hereafter may be to him, pain and suffering is no penalty of either law or Torah. The judge who pronounces the death sentence understands this, for he concludes by saying, may Elohim have mercy on your soul. That means to say, may you not be hurt hereafter. For the end of life may be painful, or it may not. If it is, it's not the punishment, it's merely an accident attending the punishment, which is death. This truth is self-evident to the reflecting mind, because however, however much the murderer might suffer in dying, that would not meet the claim of Torah or law or answer its penalty unless his life is extinguished entirely. He must be hung by the neck until he is dead. Even now our law says this in some places. But Elohim has given to us an eternal life. Life ha'olam va'ed. But that life is in his son and not in ourselves. 
It is the life-giving spirit of Elohim bestowed on those and those only who come to Messiah for it. This is that spirit that raised up Messiah from the dead and by which only can any man be quickened, brought to life, to immortality and incorruptibility. Romans 8, 11 says, without it, people perish. They're destroyed, they die, they shall be no more. Psalm 104, 35, be as though they had not even been. Obadiah 16, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23, and all the wicked will Elohim destroy. Psalm 145, 20, yes, they will all be as the fat of lambs. They will consume into smoke. They will consume away, Psalm 37, 20. In my mind, <laughs> this conclusion has been irresistible since I was a child sitting on the Baptist church pew at 10 years old uh, with a preacher telling us that if we die tonight, we're going to go to heaven forever or to hell forever. It just didn't click right with what this young lad had read in the scriptures. So, the final doom of all the impenitent and unbelieving is that they will utterly perish. This is merciful. It will be destroyed forever. Their end is to be burned up, root and branch, with fire unquenchable. It's the fire that's unquenchable. They won't have everlasting life or everlasting consciousness or being, but be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of Yahweh. How many times can that happen? It can happen only once. Either you're destroyed or you're not. Soon, I believe, the universe of Elohim will be purified, not only from sin, but from sinners too. I think this is what the prophet talks about when he says, the end. I think what he's talking about, and what Barnabas believes he is talking about, is the end of evil on earth, the end of sin on earth, when Messiah takes up the bag and calls all the demons on the earth into it and then puts a tie on the top of it and throws it into the everlasting destruction against the presence of Yahweh in the lake of fire. I believe that soon. And I believe the universe of Elohim will be purified not only from sin, but from all the works of the devil. They'll all be destroyed, exterminated die, but blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. And look, we have plenty of work to do once the devil is put out of the way. We have a world to win. So this end of evil, look for it next, because evil is coming up out of the ground right now in every way, every means that you can possibly think of. We had a talk about this last night on Q&A Friday night. It seems to me like in our country, these politicals seem to be nothing but bags of fat and bones filled up and stuffed with great big old demons. What else could it be? But Elohim promises that there will be a new sky and a new land and that the first sky and the first land are passed away. And this is what he's talking about, the end of evil. And Elohim will wipe away all tears from their eyes and there will be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither will be there any more pain. For the former things have passed away. The day when these tremendous scenes will transpire must be nigh even to the doors. Evil's parading itself now as never before. The devil is showing his hand, and that same old card is being laid on the table. 
that tells me that the time as well is at hand when the wrath of Elohim will be revealed from the skies, a day described by the apostle of indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every person that does evil. And that's the qualifier, that does evil. That is not for you unless you do evil. Then they who have sinned without Torah will also perish without Torah. And a not less fearsome doom awaits those who have sinned in the light of Torah and gospel both. For that awful day will soon overtake us. Awful for them, joyous for us. And according to today's preachers, the bags of liars, no one will escape. But we are assured, behold, for those who are evil, that day will burn as an oven. And all the proud and all that do wickedly will be as kindling, as incapable of resisting the judgment that will come upon them, as stubble is to resist the devouring flame. Go out and listen to your favorite prophets. This is the world of false prophecy. Let us be wise. Are we not prepared to meet Elohim? Sukkot is around the corner, the in-gathering, the in-crowd. Come together. Keep the high days of Yahweh, no matter how, just do your best. Not keeping them is considered to be evil, is considered to be immoral. Instead, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. But blessed are they who put their trust in him. I am not going to be worried about what these false prophets and preachers and politicians say. I am not going to fall for their conspiracies. I am not going to fall for their doomsaying. I am going to trust in Yahweh Elohim and put that stuff away from me. Study this, then go forth and contend for the innocents. With your mouth, snatch them away from the false prophets, from the theology of the Christians today. Look, there's not much time. Compel those you love to come in from the dominion of darkness, from sin and death, to the kingdom of his glorious son. These feast days are part of that kingdom. There is a chair with everybody's name on it in that tent. But very few attend and take their chair. Expose this, the greatest lie ever told, that keeps most Christians and most heathens from enjoying and proclaiming the truth of the matter. So Elohim be with you in these difficult but not unconquerable times. Amen and Amen. Heisen? We have a lot of, uh, there we go, it's gone. Thank you. Are you there, Marcio? Maybe not. Sorry, I was muted. Okay. I I read it and nobody heard me. I'm, let me do it again. When the ark rested, Moshe said, Return, O Yahweh, to the ten thousand of thousands of Yisrael. We pray together. Avinu Shoba Shamayim Yikadashimka, the Yiparek Melchucha, Retsonka, Yehi Asui Bashamayim. Uva Aretz, Vitetain Lachnu, Tereadit 
umekalanu. This is still hard for me. Ke tutinu kaasher amachnu mochalim lachotim lanu veal teveenu lede nisayon vishom renu mikol ra yamen. Our Father in the sky, may your name be sanctified. May your reign be blessed. Your will be done in sky and land. Continually give us our bread. Forgive us our sin debts as we forgive the debt of those who sin against us. Do not bring us into the nets of a snare and protect us from the evil one. Amen. We minister Shalom. Say Kamla Shalom, Malachi Hashalom, Malachi Yom. Nimelek Malachi Hamlachim, Akadosh Baruch. May your departure be in Shalom, Malachim of Shalom. Malachim of the El Elyon, coming forth from the Sovereign of Sovereigns, the Set-Apart One, blessed is He. We sing the song of peace. Shalom, my friends. Let's sing it. Shalom to you now. Shalom, my friends. May always mercies <coughs> bless you well, my friends, in all your living and through your loving. Yahweh be your shalom. Shalom, 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 shalom. shalom. Yahweh be your shalom. The leader blesses. Yivarekha Yahweh Vishmoreka Yaer Yahweh Panavaleka Vikuneka Yse Yahweh Panavaleka Vishamlecha Shalom Vashem Yahashua Moshiak Sar Shalom Amen. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, Prince of Peace. Amen. Thank you, Marcel. If you haven't got a schedule of our services for next week, Feast of Tabernacles, please let me know. Put your email in the chat here and I'll see that you get one. We're having two or three, maybe four services in the next couple weeks. And next week, Kenneth's going to preach. Good. So uh, we got Ray Boshers after that. We got such a good crowd on here today. Hallelujah. What is Yahweh doing here? Oh, aren't you getting one, Sherry? I thought you were. I'll go check and see. So in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your Shabbat. Hey, go ahead and go take a nap. What else can you do? You've had your holy convocation. Now go take a nap. Get up and enjoy your life because you've got a lot more of it to live from here on in. Amen. Service is finito. Eat cherry pie.